This is the final segment of this series of talks, and here we're going to look at the coronal and the axial plane that is looking at the patient from the front or back, which is the coronal plane, and the axial plane as if you're looking from the top down. Now remember that in gait, uh, the goal of gait is to move the body forward. So there's a lot of motion and movement when you're looking at the side view because the body is moving forward. But you want to conserve energy in the, in the coronal plane and in the axial plane rotation uh, in both planes so that there is actually very little motion uh, here. And you can see that there is very little motion, that if you look carefully, you may be able to ascertain that on the swing phase side, the pelvis is lifting up a little bit during swing phase, but otherwise things stay pretty quiet. And here is the reconstructed skeleton where you can see the pelvic motion a little more clearly and you can see that with landing and through stance phase, the pelvis is down a bit, and then it goes up during swing phase to help the swing phase limb clear, and that's what you see here on this graph. However, when there are abnormalities in the way the muscles function or in the way the anatomy is arranged, uh, you do see abnormalities, and we're gonna go over these uh, one by one. At the trunk, you may see excessive lean toward the stance phase side dynamically as the patient walks. And you can see this girl shifts her weight over to the stance phase side with each step, right and left. Reason being that she has an unstable fulcrum. She has bilateral congenital dislocated hips, uh, so she has an unstable fulcrum, and the abductor mechanism uh, cannot work effectively. Whereas this boy, who has an even more marked Trendelenburg gait, that is shift of his weight toward the weight-bearing side, and in his case, this is due to weak musculature. He has a congenital myopathy giving him weak abductors. On the other hand, in cerebral palsy patients, particularly the diplegic patients who may have the potential to walk, they tend to have overactive adductors. That is, they're working throughout the entire gait cycle and they're working excessively. So that although he is standing with a little bit of support, he really can't move his legs because not only is it difficult to get one in front of the other because they're so tightly adducted, the adductors are basically locking uh, the femur to the pelvis so that he can't really uh, overcome this with his other muscles in order to ambulate. So he underwent bilateral releases of the adductor longus, gracilis, and the iliopsoas. Uh, he was um, um, not put in a cast, but just used an abduction pillow at nighttime, and then on about the second post-operative day began active therapy stressing functional activities, not stretching. You don't want to aggressively stretch these patients as it may irritate the released muscles. And here he is four and a half years later. You can see he's independently walking with the walker for balance. And now it's clear that he has developed a jump type gait with knee flexion, ankle plantar flexion, and probably excessive hip flexion. So he underwent uh, hamstring lengthening and transfer, rectus femoris transposition, and strayer gastrocnemius release preserving the soleus. And he's only three and a half months post-operative here, so he's a little weak, but you can see his uh, uh, gait pattern has uh, significantly improved and as he strengthens, will improve further. 
Now the valgus uh, that you see frequently in the diplegic patients at the ankle is not due to excessive pull of the everters, but rather to lack of a medial sling to provide stability for the subtalar joint and stance phase. So if you watch some of these patients carefully, you can see that the valgus increases as the foot is loaded. Whereas varus, on the other hand, is an active deformity, and this is characteristic in hemiplegic patients, not diplegic patients, that they have varus. And this is overactivity of the tibialis posterior, frequently accompanied by other deep posterior compartment muscles, as well as the gastroxoleus. So next we'll look at the axial plane. This is as, you're, as if you are looking from the top down or up from the bottom, a view that you don't actually have, but you can reconstruct in your brain uh, from looking at the coronal plane, but the computer does quite a nice job of it. And what you see in the axial plane is the movement of the limbs, the forward in swing phase, and then the stance phase limb becoming relatively extended as the pelvis moves forward on the planted foot. So that you can see this movement of extension of the hip bringing the center of mass forward. Uh, the pelvis is relatively quiet, but there is a little bit of motion of the pelvis forward in swing phase to help elongate the step. So this means that the stance phase limb becomes relatively posterior or retracted as the pelvis moves forward on the swing phase limb and becomes more anterior or protracted. And these are the curves and you can see they're fairly straight. There's not much movement uh, in this axial plane uh, with the exception of that pelvic rotation that moves forward in swing phase. But we do see abnormalities. And here, for example, um, is a girl who we saw earlier who has fixed abnormalities in the uh, rotational alignment of her lower extremities. And you can see that her patellae are markedly turned in as a result of her lack of ability to externally rotate due to increased femoral antiversion. And in addition, uh, her foot progression appears to be even greater than one would expect with this degree of interning of the patella, so you might suspect internal tibial torsion. These deformities were confirmed by physical examination where she had uh, less than 10 degrees of external rotation and about 80 degrees of internal rotation. And when checking her foot thigh angles, she had definite evidence of internal tibial torsion. And you can see this on the skeleton, which was reconstructed from her gait analysis study. Uh, you can see excessive pelvic motion, and you can see the femur on both sides is internal, and perhaps you can also appreciate that the tibia are turned in even further as a result of her internal tibial torsion. But this is actually more apparent on the graphs where you can see the excessive pelvic rotation, the hip rotation, which is indicative of her internal femoral rotation throughout the gait cycle, and her, the knee rotation graph, which shows the uh, relationship of the distal tibia to the proximal tibia uh, and how it is internally rotated. So she has a combination of internal tibial torsion as well as increased femoral antiversion, which can also be considered as internal femoral torsion. So she underwent uh, bilateral femoral and tibial rotation osteotomies. She did have some knee flexion at the time, but uh, I chose to stage her muscle releases uh, because sometimes when you do 
the bony rotational correction. You do see correction of some sagittal plane deformities. But she persisted in this knee flexion, so a year and a half later when she had her hardware removed, she also underwent bilateral hamstring lengthening plus transfer and rectus femoris transfer. Here she is six weeks post uh, that soft tissue surgery along with her plate removal. And so she's still a little weak, but she uh, became an uh, independent ambulator without any assistive device. So she became uh, stronger. Here she is nine years later. Uh, she's a, in her senior year of high school, which is why she's wearing this uh, T-shirt with the logo that says, keep calm and graduate. Here she is. Notice that she doesn't get her heels completely down, but I have resisted doing any kind of posterior compartment lengthening uh, for fear of weakening her dorsiflexion and stance phase and uh, causing her knee flexion to recur. And of course, she did graduate and is doing well. So summary, coronal and axial planes. The goal here is to keep things quiet and conserve energy. That in order to help the swing phase limb move forward, the pelvis elevates in swing and also during swing goes from a relatively posterior position to a relatively anterior position to help uh, create a longer step uh, to keep moving the body forward on a level surface. And in summary uh, of our whole process, the goal here is to help you learn how to look at gait in a very systematic fashion. If we look from the foot to the knee to the ankle in this animation, you see how the foot loads at the heel, the foot plantar flexes a little to become foot flat as the tibia advances forward in stance phase. The gastrocnemius and soleus fire to help support it. Uh, and this helps to control the forward motion and also to keep the knee in extension during stance phase, which is more passive and mechanical and supported by the foot and ankle than by the quadriceps, which is relatively quiet in mid to late stance. The knee goes into full extension to provide stability in stance after a short period of flexion to help absorb the shock. Um, and then through swing phase goes into flexion, primarily created by the flexion of the femur with the hamstrings acting as a bit of a posterior tether to bring the knee into flexion in mid swing. And then the real power of gait comes from the hip and you can see that in early stance both the hamstrings and the gluteus maximus are firing concentrically to extend the hip and stance and thereby bring the center of mass forward. So species all ambulate in different ways. Uh, this one looks like he's having a lot of fun and he has very interesting uh, biomechanics with his trunk and center of mass way forward and using that tail as a counterbalance. And also the kangaroo has a very long Achilles tendon which has a lot of elasticity. So as he jumps uh, higher, the tendon deforms more as he lands and then gives back some of that energy uh, like a stretched rubber band with the next step. So it's said, uh, according to some studies, that as the, this animal moves faster and faster, it doesn't really have to expend much more energy because of this energy storage in the Achilles tendon. So remember, systematic approach is essential to identify problems reflected in the gait. You have to go through joint by joint and you have to understand normal gait in order to do this. And then, and only then, uh, can you develop a treatment program. So it's useful to have a gait observation worksheet like this, 
where you look at the sagittal, coronal, and transverse planes at each joint separately, and you can note uh, where any abnormalities may exist, uh, both in stance phase and swing phase, and then you can develop interventions, be it orthotics, botulinum toxin, uh, physiotherapy, or surgery to try and minimize the impact of these problems. So another good reference is this book by uh, Dr. Richard Baker, uh, which has very clear uh, and precise uh, explanations of uh, normal gait. And I'd like to end with this painting, uh, which I like to show when I talk about uh, issues related to cerebral palsy, uh, because it's not just the technical side of things that we're dealing with. Um, this painting shows mom bringing the baby out to the garden to show dad that she's taken her first steps. And you have to remember for our patients and families, it's not this easy. Uh, this milestone may be significantly delayed and the patient may be using orthotics and uh, some assistive device. So you must be sensitive to the psychosocial needs of both the child and the family uh, as you deal with these technical issues. So I thank you very much. Uh, if you come to Oregon, don't forget to visit Crater Lake. It's a really beautiful spot. Thank you. <laughs>